Okay, thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, dear participant, uh, participants, it's my pleasure to welcome you in the present workshop. Uh, first, if you hear me, Prof. John, hear me. Just uh, unmute your mic. Are you hearing me? I can okay. hear you. Fine. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, first, uh, dear participants, uh, first let me to welcome the lecturers of the present workshop uh, associated with Professor John uh, Parrington and uh, Dr. Ala Hachim. Uh, first, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Professor John uh, Parrington. Uh, John obtained a bachelor in uh, zoology at the University of Cambridge and his PhD from the University of London and the uh, Imperial Cancer Research Fund. After a postdoctoral uh, research period at the uh, MRC National Institute for Medical Research, John was awarded uh, an MRC Career Development Fellowship, uh, followed by an MRC Senior Non-Clinical Fellowship at University College London. He joined the Department of Pharmacology, University of Oxford, uh, in uh, 2002 and took up a university leadership in 2006. John is now an associate professor in molecular pharmacology and a tutorial fellow in medicine uh, at uh, Worcester College, Oxford. Uh, uh, the title of the uh, present workshop is The Rise of a CRISPR Case System a gene editing tool that uh, is for, uh, transforming by biomedical research and re uh, reshaping the world around us. The first hour presentation uh, will be presented by uh, uh, by Professor John uh, Parrington, entitled "Redesigning Life: How Genome Editing Will Transform the World." Uh, the second hour presentation which will be presented by uh, Dr. Ala Hachim, entitled the Practical Guide for Creating a Transgenic Animal Model, the uh, Knockout Approach. Uh, uh, first, uh, welcome, welcome again, uh, Prof. John. And uh, you are now uh, as a co-host in the workshop. You can just uh, share your uh, presentation on uh, on the desktop and uh, just unmic uh, unmute your mic and start yeah and i'm going to show my presentation is that can you see the presentation okay Uh, so, sorry, Prof. John. Are you hearing me when I introduce you? Yes, I heard you fine. Can, can you see my presentation okay? Okay, now your presentation is ready. Okay, okay. you can Thank start. You. I will start Go on. for that kind of introduction. So yes, what I'm going to talk about today is um, the subject of genome editing. It's actually the um, subject of my popular science book, Redesigning Life, which the paperback edition will be coming out in July, actually, so it's a new edition. But also, we've been doing uh, CRISPR-Cas genome editing in our lab, so it's both something that I've got a general interest in, as well as a specific interest in terms of our lab research. Um, so the presentation that I'm going to give today is a fairly small presentation, but um, I will then draw out some of the more general and specific points. Uh, and obviously, if people want to then ask me questions, I'll be very happy to answer as many questions as people want. Um, so I think, um, yeah, the, so the first, I've gone a bit too fast there. Okay, so the first thing I think to say that's important is that uh, CRISPR-Cas genome editing is a revolutionary new way of editing the genome. So obviously, in the past, we had... Um, other ways to edit the genome. We had the uh, revolution in molecular, bio molecular biology revolution in the 1970s, when restriction enzymes were first discovered and other enzymes like DNA ligase. 
And that meant it was possible for the first time to cut and paste um, genes into vectors into and create a gene construct. And these could be then transfected into, say, a bacterium. And that led to the first biotechnology um, boom. So we had um, companies like Genentech that came out of that, um, that work that then marketed human insulin for diabetics. Um, so insulin that being produced in a bacterium. And this was very important because it meant for the first time we could produce biologically important, clinically important products um, in a bacterium. So for someone like a diabetic who'd had to rely on insulin that come from um, a pig, I think it was generally the pigs that were used to produce the, the insulin, slaughtered pigs. Um, uh, and there were all sorts of issues about using that pig insulin, uh, obviously for religious reasons, but also the fact that the pig insulin was slightly different from the human insulin um, meant that sometimes there were reactions in diabetics and, and that was an issue. And of course, there were lots of other biologically important proteins like factor eight that's uh, missing in, in some uh, haemophilia, uh, um, other all sorts of other biological products that, that have now been made using that, that route. Um, but you could argue that although that was a major step forward in our ability to manipulate life, there were problems with that. W one problem was that essentially the cutting and pasting of DNA could only be done in a test tube. And then these constructs were then introduced into say bacteria, but there was no control over where the, ba the, um, the construct ended up in the bacterial genome. Um, and then subsequent to that work, then other scientists in the, towards the end of the 1970s and the early 80s began to find ways to manipulate more complex organisms. So for instance, there was the first Knock out, uh, the first uh, transgenic mouse that was made at that time. This was a mouse that um, had a gene construct for the human growth hormone, uh, which meant that that mouse could then be induced to express that human growth hormone. By It, it had a, a promoter behind the gene, which was metal sensitive. So by feeding the, the mouse cadmium, the metal heavy metal cadmium, you could induce expression of this human growth hormone in the mouse. And as a consequence, we got these uh, huge mice that were bigger than normal. So kind of thing that gives, can give science a bad name that, that this kind of playing around with life. But um, the important aspect of that transgenic technology was it meant it was possible for the first time to start to look at the function of genes in, in, in the body. Now, in particular, um, developing on from that in the late 80s, there were then methods uh, developed um, using embryonic stem cells that made it possible to create the first knockout to knock in mice. So these are mice that have a, either a deletion in a gene or maybe a subtle mutation in, in a gene. But the problems with that technology were, when, well, although it revolutionized our ability to, um, to, to study gene function in a living mammal, the problems with that technology was that it was only possible to do this in a very laborious uh, set of procedures. So first you had to get embryonic stem cells. You had to then knock out the gene or knock in the gene in those embryonic stem cells. It was a very inefficient technique. So about one in a million uh, cells were, were, were altered in that way. And the only way you could then select those cells was by drug selection. Having then done that, you then had to inject the embryonic stem cells into a mouse blastocyst. And that then um, was then able to produce a chimera. And then if you bred the chimeras, you could eventually make a knockout or a knocking mice mouse. But, but this was all very laborious and very expensive. So we're talking about anything from 20 to $40,000 to make a typical knockout mouse. And often it took several years to do this. So very slow procedure, very laborious. The other major flaw with this technology was that um, it could only be done in mice uh, because some reason mice and that actually more recently rats as well, but only rodents essentially um, have, have been, we, we've been able to get embryonic stem cells from these species, these rodent species. So it meant that you couldn't make knockout or knock inversions of, of other uh, species in any, in any easy way. So anyway, to get to the, the, the new technology, what's really revolutionized the whole business of making um, genetically modified organisms and, and, and cells, and in fact, we're, we're going to talk about the, the particular applications, 
is the development of so-called gene editing technologies. So this um, ability to edit the genome, and, and the big difference here is that this means editing the genome in a living cell as opposed to making a construct and then transfecting this uh, into, a, into a cell or altering a cell and then injecting this into an embryo. Um, so essentially the big discovery, I think, that, that led to this development of gene editing was the discovery made by Maria Jasin in New York in the 90s when she was studying uh, mechanisms of cancer and she showed that if you make a double, if, if a, a chromosome uh, is, is split in two as part of a carcinogenic process, then the uh, double-stranded break that's, that's created in, in the DNA is sensed by the cell and there are two mechanisms that can then try and repair that break which is shown here on the on the slide on the right hand side so essentially the double stranded break can either be repaired by a process called non-homologous end joining which will make a, a repair but often does so in a way that it creates a frame shift mutation or if you have a piece of dna that's homologous to that region that you've cut then you can get um, a more exact uh, replacement of, of the gene. And if you have a piece of DNA that, for instance, had a mutation or any, any kind of change that's different from the original gene, that's a way that you could introduce some changes into the, um, into the gene. Now, of course, in the cell, this, this is a repair mechanism that tries to repair damage uh, that's been done. But the, the fact that this happens naturally in cells and actually incredibly efficiently and quite, quite uh, uh, to say it's quite efficiently really, um, led to the idea that um, uh, if you could somehow make, find a way to make a double-stranded break in a, a chromosome, in, in, a cell, in a living cell, um, then the, 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 uh, in, in a specific place in the genome, then the cell itself could then repair the break or, or, or alter the, uh, the gene in such a way that you could make a knockout or a knock-in uh, of that gene. And that led to the discovery of, uh, well, rather not so much the discovery, but the creation of tools to be able to allow us to make a double-stranded break. In particular, the zinc finger nucleases in the talons were the first um, way of gene editing tools. And they allowed us for the first time to make double-stranded breaks in the specific sequence in the genome of any living cell. Um, the downside of was that that meant creating a de novo, a protein, an enzyme, a cutting enzyme that uh, would, would allow you to do this. So in particular, what that involved was to take the restriction enzyme FOC1 and then to take the, um, the cutting domain of that enzyme and link that to a series of um, DNA binding motifs. First, the, the first wave was the zinc finger nucleus, so that comes from the zinc finger binding proteins that you find in steroid hormones. And then second, the talons that come from um, enzymes, some DNA binding uh, transcription factors that you find in, in, in plants. Um, and so that was the first two, the two, two types of gene editing tools. But the problem was that to make a new enzyme every time, that involves a huge amount of expense and, and labor. And so instead, what's really revolutionized the gene editing is the development of a very different kind of technology called CRISPR-Cas9. Now, like many of the technologies that we use in molecular biology, this is found in nature. So it's a system that, that works in bacteria. And uh, essentially what happens is that when a bacteriophage, which is a virus that infects bacteria, um, infects a bacterial species, um, then what happens is there's a mechanism called CRISPR repeats that um, can then be used to create a guide RNA, which is an RNA that is specific. It's homologous to the viral DNA, the, vi the DNA of the virus that's infecting the bacterium. And what then happens is that this um, guide RNA, because it can then recognize the viral RNA, the viral genome, it can then um, allow an enzyme called Cas9, which is an endonuclease, which cuts DNA to cut the viral genome in half, and that disables the virus. Not only that, but the, um, the, the, the viral, uh, the guide RNA is then kept within the genome of that bacterial species in these CRISPR repeats. And it's essentially a, a way of recognizing that virus in future. So if that bacterial species is infected again by that uh, virus, then it will, like an immune system in, in, in people, 
that will uh, then protect uh, the bacterial species from the virus. In the same way as we're hoping that the um, SARS-CoV-2 virus, when it infects people, will lead to immunity, but obviously we still need some evidence that that's actually really happening. But it's the same basic idea that immunity, in this case, of the bacterium against the virus, um, is, is, is what this is all about, just as we'd hope to get immunity against our, our viruses ourselves. Now, the important aspect of this in terms of genome editing is that once it was recognised, particularly by scientists like um, Jennifer Downer, Emmanuel Charpentier, um, that this is, this is a mechanism, it's a guide RNA uh, that's then specific to the, um, to the virus and, 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 and a Cas9 enzyme. They recognised that if you, you, what you could do is you could, you could commandeer this system as a gene editing tool because all you need to do is to make a guide RNA that instead of being specific to a virus is specific to a particular sequence in the genome of any species that you want, any living cell of any species that you want to, to target. And from that, that's then led to the development of the whole CRISPR-Cas um, gene editing technology. Um, so I think one thing to say actually before I go on to talk about some of the applications is that so that's then led to all sorts of applications uh, that are important for medical research. So in particular, in terms of medical research um, in, in a lab like my own, it's allowed us to create knockout, uh, gene knockouts in, in human cells. At the moment, my lab is particularly interested in melanoma, the, um, the, the, the skin cancer. And because we had some uh, interest in seeing whether the genes that we were studying in our lab, they, they're called TUPO channels or TPC genes, we wanted to know if these have a role in um, melanoma. We've been able to make human and mouse uh, melanoma cells, of, of cell lines of different stages of melanoma. So we've got some that correspond to the first stage of melanoma, others that correspond to the more metastatic line, uh, the more metastatic kind of cancer. And we've been able to show that these TPC uh, genes play an important role in um, metastatic melanoma. But we've also been able to use it to make knockout mice. And, and Allah uh, is going to talk later about this, about, about work that he did when working in the lab, using the uh, technology to make a, a peel disease to knock out mouse. Um, but essentially it allows us to do all sorts of uh, manipulations, gene manipulations in the lab in, 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 in all sorts of ways that we wouldn't have been able to do with half the speed in, in the past. In fact, as I say, with the human cells, it would have been impossible to do these at all. Now, the other, I think, important aspect of this technology is that because if you uh, can inject the guide RNA and the Cas9 into a fertilized egg, well, you can kind of do this for any species where you can isolate eggs and, and fertilize them and then implant them back into the mother and so what we've been able to do is to make not just knock out mice but knock out pigs so we've been able to make tpc2 knock out pigs and we're about to study these and we've got three piglets at the moment uh, all homozygous knockouts so i should say one of the other quite amazing things about the technology is it's often quite common to be able to create a, a homozygous knockout in a single generation so you inject the fertilized egg uh, you then allow that, you implant that back into the mother, you can end up with a homozygous knockout in a single stage. Now, obviously what you then really generally need to do is to then create a knockout line. But one of the advantages of this technology is that we've already been able to create uh, three homozygous knockout pigs, TPC2 knockout pigs. And the reason this is important is that we previously, with uh, TPC knockout mice, we've been able to show an important role for TPC2 in heart uh, function. So we've shown that the TPC2 knockout heart uh, doesn't uh, respond, doesn't contract when, when it's exposed to adrenaline in the way that uh, normally the heart, the mouse heart would. And also these mice seem to be, uh, seem to be resistant to, to arrhythmias uh, and to hypertrophy of the heart. So there's a real interest here in trying to then develop this as, a, as a pharmacologically, we can target TPC2 to see if we can uh, target arrhythmias and hypertrophy of the heart. Now that's all valuable work, but unfortunately the mouse heart and the human heart are still quite different, not only in size, but in all sorts of physiological ways. And that means that having a knockout pig, TPC2 knockout pig, will allow us to really explore the potential of this 
difference, the genetic difference and its pharmacological consequences uh, in a pig model uh, in, in a way that could be uh, very valuable. Now, I, I recognise that not everyone wants to work on pigs and, and there's reasons why some people uh, would, would choose not to work on the pig uh, for religious reasons or all sorts of reasons. But of course, one can apply this technology to lots of other species, so sheep, cows, there's no real limit to the sort of animal models that you can um, you can use this technology for. Primates, I mean, obviously for neuroscience, then the primate is a very important model for studying uh, brain function and uh, diseases of the brain. So this is all very revolutionary in the way it's allowing us to break into uh, all sorts of, of different animal models that we wouldn't have been able to uh, do in the past. And of course, there's lots of other uses for the, this technology in the lab from a pharmacological point of view, I work in a pharmacology department. There's lots of interest in identifying new molecular targets for drugs. And one of the um, advantages of this method is it allows you, for instance, to do genome-wide screens to look for new molecular targets uh, for drugs. And so this is all possible using the CRISPR method. So what I thought, having introduced the technology and also talked about the uh, ways that we've been able to use it in research terms, is to also look at some of the more practical applications of this technology, which I think means it's a technology that every country and every university really should be trying to develop uh, as, as a way to uh, break into these very important different areas. So one of the um, ways in which CRISPR-Cas has, I think, got revolutionary potential in agriculture is for the first time it allows us to really um, make genetic changes in, in, in for instance, crops and, and farm animals in a way that could have big implications for agriculture of the future. Now, I don't know what it's like in Iraq, but certainly in Britain, it's been a very controversial subject, the use of GM modification in, in agriculture. And I think that's partly because some people have uh, concerns about the playing God or, or um, you know, this idea that we are doing things that humans shouldn't really be doing, playing with life. Uh, or they've got concerns about the safety of the crops or the animals. Um, but th you could also argue that um, there's also a certain amount of concern about uh, the, the, the kind of where we're doing the genetic engineering. Is it really uh, specific? Is it really um, safe? Or are there all sorts of potential problems of the way we're doing that? And although I think we can actually dismiss many of the concerns about the safety of many of the crops and, and, and animals that we create in this way, and also, I would argue that it is a valid thing to, to manipulate life in the sense we've been manipulating life uh, ever since the, the agricultural revolution, which, of course, started in, in the Middle East, uh, in, in um, very near to Iraq, when we first, uh, human beings for the first time, started to uh, cultivate crops and uh, keep our farm animals. And, and in a way, by selecting those animals and selecting those crops, selecting specific varieties, we did, um, we did change life, we have been manipulating life. But um, I think one thing that's really revolutionary about the new technology is that it allows us to edit the genome of crops and farm animals in a way that's unprecedented in its specificity. And I would hope because of that, it's also a much safer technology and one that we can really manipulate and use in, in a way that should you know, help humanity rather than being a bad thing. Um, clearly, it's still a controversial area though, because um, I mean, one of the things that has been already approved in, um, in, a, in the USA is that they've been using this technology for, for instance, to alter mushrooms. So these are mushrooms that would normally go brown if you leave them in the fridge. Well, in this case, they have been altered so that they don't go brown as quickly in the fridge. Now, some people might consider this frivolous, other people might think, well, it's a way of, of not wasting mushrooms. But of course, there are lots of other ways in which we can modify the properties of um, crops which could be um, very important from a kind of food um, technology point of view. I think one thing that ought to be something that you know, most people could, could, could see as a good thing is the potential to use genome editing, CRISPR-Cas in particular, to create disease-resistant crops and animals. So what I've shown here on the, in the middle of this, this uh, slide is uh, a plan to, which is already kind of quite advanced now, to create... Um, pigs that are resistant to a disease called um, African swine fever. So this is a major problem for the pig industry in, uh, in Europe, in, in the Far East, 
uh, because it's a virus that normally in, in warthogs, the wild uh, pig, has no big impact, whereas in the domesticated pig, it can kill pigs very easily because you get an overreaction in the immune system of this virus. But because there's a mutation in, in the wild pig, in the warp top, that you can introduce into the domestic pig using CRISPR, you can then ideally create a pig that has um, resistance to this, to this virus. Uh, and this, this is already now going ahead, this, this plan to do this. But of course, there's lots of other animal species out there, you know, sheep and, and goats uh, and cows and all sorts of other species that we eat, chickens, that also uh, can, can get viruses that, that are very damaging to them. And there's lots of potential then for essentially taking a gene that you would find in, say, a wild species that's resistant to these viruses and then introducing this into the domestic species. And also in crops, I mean, the um, mushrooms, uh, so, uh, fungi in particular can be a made bomb for some plants. The potato that um, uh, was grown in Ireland, uh, basically fed the peasants in Ireland in the 19th century, uh, was attacked in the mid 19th century by a fungus, the blight fungus, that led to the Irish famine of, the, of 1848. Um, and, and, and even to this day, uh, potatoes are very susceptible to blight and, and we spend billions of, of dollars every year on, on using fungicides to, to combat this. So not only is this very expensive, but it's also very bad for the environment. So the idea is to use CRISPR to create potato, domestic potatoes that are resistant to this virus. And the reason we can do this is there are naturally occurring mutations in wild potato species that you could introduce into a domestic potato crop to protect it. So one of the arguments put in, in favour of this kind of GM technology, as opposed to previous GM technologies applied to agriculture, is that this is um, something that is really just taking something, so a naturally occurring mutation that occurs in nature, and introducing it in, into a slightly more, uh, into a very similar species. So one could argue it's, it's really quite a natural kind of thing to do. Of course, not everyone who's, who's, who's opposed to GM technology is going to accept this argument, but it's one of the ways it's been justified. Now, moving from agriculture to medicine, the other um, aspect I think that's, that's really quite revolution, quite exciting um, about this technology is the possibility of using it in gene therapy. So, so clearly we have... Um, major problems with, with, with some diseases that certain people are born with a genetic defect. So I'm thinking of things like sickle cell anemia, thalassemia, um, cystic fibrosis. So these are all recessive disorders. So you can get these by your mother and father passing them on to you as carriers without recognizing they're doing so. But also there are dominant disorders. We have dwarfism, we have a Huntington's disorder, which are dominant disorders. Now, uh, although there's been this dream for many years, really since the genetic revolution of the 70s, that we could somehow use gene therapy to help people with these disorders. This has never really materialized. And one of the problems has been the kind of crude nature of the technologies we've had have not really allowed us to, to help people in this way. But one thing that's, that's now becoming more and more feasible with, with CRISPR, at least it, it seems like a, not just not less of a dream now, but a real possibility, is to gene edit um, uh, cells that are defective, have these defective genes in, in a person. Now, what we'll almost certainly find is that some disorders will be more easy to treat than others. Disorders of the blood, thinking of things like sickle cell, uh, thalassemia, those kind of things, um, make sense as, as, as for the first line of treatment because these are diseases where you can take the, the stem cells from the bone marrow treat the, the bone marrow stem cells and then put these back into a person uh, and that will then hopefully correct the disorder. Whereas obviously for something like cystic fibrosis or Huntington's, Huntington's which are disease that mainly affects uh, the, first the, 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 the lungs in cystic fibrosis or the brain in Huntington's, clearly that's a more, um, a bigger challenge is to then change the, 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 the genome. Same for muscular dystrophy. Again, it's, it's not a trivial thing to think about correcting the muscle and the heart tissue uh, in a living person. Um, but I do think that there's all sorts of exciting possibilities now, not only in terms of these um, genetic diseases, but also uh, in terms of infectious diseases. So already there's been lots of uh, studies that are showing that we may be able to soon treat things like HIV or um, hepatitis. So in fact, all number of viral disorders, maybe even COVID, if it turns out to be 
resistant to, for, to, to vaccine development or, um, or, or, or a drug that will affect that. Uh, of course, there's lots of obstacles on the way. I, I have given talks like this to groups of people who suffer from these genetic disorders or people who care for them because sometimes they're too ill to even attend a, a talk. Um, and one thing I always stress, obviously, is the, the number of obstacles still to get an actual cure that can be useful to, to, to actual people. And so we need lots of testing in animals. We need lots of proper clinical trials. Um, but I think the, the futures in that sense is very exciting. And also cancer is a big area. Already there are clinical trials going on in, um, in, in China in particular, where they are testing um, CRISPR-Cas technology as a way to treat certain types of cancer. So the other, some of the, what I'd consider the more uh, beneficial and I would hope less controversial areas of the technology. But one of the other things that I thought I should really mention while I'm talking about uh, CRISPR-Cas technology are some of the more contro controversial areas uh, where, where this could lead us. So controversial for some people, exciting for others, and, and really there's no um, easy, uh, Debate, you know, position on this, we can see both points of view, I think. Um, so one thing I thought would consider is the possibility of using this technology to make human organs. Now, human organs are necessary because uh, people can, can often need a, a new organ, whether it's a heart or, or a liver or, or a lung transplant, uh, kidney transplant. And at the moment, we rely on donors who have uh, died. Who are, sometimes, obviously, with a kidney, you can get a donation from a living person. But in general, these come from people who've died and donated their organs to, to, um, to medical research and to help other people. And uh, unfortunately, there are, there are major problems with that. One is that uh, to have, uh, to have an, an organ uh, from someone else, uh, in general, we tend to reject organs from other people because of the um, MLA, uh, the MHC, HLA antigens on organs. In general, we would reject an organ if it was introduced into our body because of that mismatch. And it's rare to find a match. So when we hear about someone is waiting for a, an organ transplant and they're looking for a, a donor match, what this means is we're looking for the you know one in a few thousand chance of them having a perfect match with another person that organ will be rejected. And the other problem is that there's simply not enough people dying and leaving their organs to... Uh, to, for, for, for donation, um, which is uh, obviously another problem. There's simply not enough people out there willing to donate their organs. Um, so to address this problem, there's been some interest for a while in um, developing um, what's called xenotransplantation, which is to use an animal which is, uh, then, and then use the organ from the animal. So in particular, there's been lots of talk about the fact that pigs, because these are animals that have... Um, similar size and physiology of human being, then you can take a, a heart from a pig and introduce it into a person. Now, of course, there may be religious and other reasons why people wouldn't want to have an organ from a pig, and who knows, there may be other species that could also be used. But at the moment, the main uh, development has been of uh, xenoplantation using the pig. And the idea is that you could take, as I say, a pig heart and introduce this into a person. Now, clearly, the problem with that would be that as we reject an organ from a person, from a typical person, of course, we're going to reject an organ from a pig. And because of that, there's been an interest for some time in modifying pigs genetically so that they have organs that wouldn't be, they've been changed, that the antigens on the surface of the organ are changed so that they are not rejected by a human body. Um, now, one of the ways that CRISPR-Cas could help this technology is it allows us to, to make these modifications in the pig, but it also allows us to eradicate any uh, retroviruses that are present in the pig genome, because there was some concern that if an organ was introduced into a living person, it would then, the virus, these the retroviruses would, would emerge from the tissue and would then spread around the body. and could even start a pandemic, and as we've seen, the dangers of animal viruses that come from, from uh, that then travel into people, we've seen that with the latest COVID pandemic, just how dangerous that can be. And in fact, HIV is also thought to have spread from, from uh, chimpanzees to humans as well. So not a trivial issue to, 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 to think about, really. Um, now, because of this, um, the, 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 as I said, there's, there's an interest in xenotransplantation that would either would have pigs that had organs that wouldn't be, um, wouldn't be rejected. 
but would also be uh, free of any kind of viruses. But there is also another plan that's been pursued by a scientist called Belmonte in the United States, Juan um, Belmonte in the States. And he is trying to develop a technology for growing human organs in pigs. Now, this obviously sounds like science fiction. It might be someone's worst nightmare. But for other people who think, well, you know, at least it would allow us to produce human organs uh, that were not, you know, not like a pig organ, an actual human organ, then this could be an important technology. So what in this case it would involve is using the, the stem cell technology, because basically you can take um, skin cells from an individual and you can then make iPS cells. These are clearly important stem cells from this person. And then um, you can then obviously use these in all sorts of ways. But one of the things about them is that they are a tissue match to that individual. So the idea uh, then of, of what Belmont is trying to do is to make use of the fact that if you genetically engineer a pig embryo, so it doesn't, um, can't produce an organ because you've knocked out the gene that, that forms that, that helps form that organ, the gene network that helps form that organ. What you could potentially then do is to introduce uh, stem cells from a, a person in a tissue match to, to, to an individual into that pig embryo. And then the idea is that would then fill in the, the, the missing organ. So uh, you produce a human heart in a pig or a liver or a kidney or, or a pancreas. Um, and it, this is based on, on evidence that the fact this might work is based on evidence that you can get this to work in, in, in a mouse and a rat. So if you can take mouse stem cells, you can introduce them into a rat and, and you get the organ, the, the mouse organ growing inside the rat. Um, now, as it turns out, the experiments have shown that there are still major obstacles ahead in getting this technology to work. One of the potential problems is that a pig embryo only takes, well, it takes four months to develop inside the, the, the mother's womb, whereas uh, in a human, obviously, we know it's nine months. And so what the scientists are needing to do is to find some way to, to balance this mismatch. So it's basically to try and get human organs to grow much faster uh, in, in the pig. Uh, but clearly this is only one of the, the, the obstacles. That's a technical obstacle. Clearly there are other people who would be absolutely hor horrified at the idea that we, in the future we might be producing these uh, human organs in pigs, or, or I guess it could be done in, in another species as well for that matter. Uh, but there you go. That is just showing the potential in the future for, for, for using this in this way. But we basically we would be able to have organs, tissue matched to our bodies, producing an animal. Now, another very controversial technology, a use of the technology of genetic is it is shown here in the middle of this uh, slide and this is so-called gene drives so these are a use of uh, crispr cas technology when uh, you introduce a change not into a specific um, individual in a, uh, or in a lab in, a, in an animal in a lab but you actually introduce a change that then sweeps through the population of a, through a species and the reason this is being put forward as, as an important thing to do is that malaria, which kills millions of people around the world? I mean, we, we tend to think, obviously, at the moment of COVID as being the big disease to talk about, but clearly there are lots of other infectious diseases out there that kill millions of people every year. I think 70 million people die of infectious diseases every year. And one of the big killers is malaria. And millions of people die of malaria every year. And so there are lots of ways, there's lots of interest in trying to develop new ways to, to, to combat malaria. And one way, one way would be to use a gene drive to modify the malaria mosquito, the mosquitoes that carry malaria. So the idea is that by introducing a change called a, a, a gene drive that sweeps through the, the population of, of the, the mosquito population, the wild population of mosquitoes, that would then uh, potentially allow you to make a, a mosquito that was incapable of carrying the parasite, or if you want to eradicate the mosquito species completely, then you could create the make mosquitoes all female so they were now unable to breed. Now, uh, although for people who think that the, the most important thing is to get rid of malaria, that sounds like a fantastic idea. Um, other people have pointed out, and this is a debate among scientists, it's not simply you know, scientists versus non-scientists. Uh, there's a debate among scientists about the, the, the potential risks in doing this, because obviously if you alter a wild species, that could have big implications in terms of the ecosystem. I mean, although we'd be only knocking out a specific mosquito species, and some could argue, well, that wouldn't be any loss to the world, really, because it would be simply one mosquito species. There are, um, for instance, types of swallow, the, 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 the birds, the swallow birds that, that feed on these particular species. 
So could that have implications in terms of the knocking effects in the ecosystem? Um, what if these mosquitoes somehow then manage to uh, evolve to be even more resistant to, to this kind of technology and, and to malaria and to be even worse carriers of malaria? So lots of potential issues there. Um, and what's kind of also interesting is that um, one of the things that the technical obstacles that's really come up in this work um, is that it seems that life is actually quite good at not being eradicated. So there's lots of mechanisms in evolution to stop a species being eradicated. Uh, and it's interesting that the, um, the attempts to try and get this drive that makes the, the males disappear uh, is actually surprisingly difficult to actually achieve. So maybe the nature is fighting back here and showing that it doesn't want to be you know, destroyed in this way. And then to move on to the, the final um, controversial area, um, well, I think that's really the idea that we might use this technology in the future to create human beings that have uh, differences that are not um, differences in, in susceptibility to disease, but all sorts of changes, you know, intelligence and their sporting ability, uh, the physical, you know, look, your beauty and all these kind of things. And the reason that this has become very controversial, this whole area, is that I'm sure people might have heard that um, there have been uh, attempts to modify human embryos, and it, it, not just for research, which is happening in various labs uh, as a way to study the genes involved in, in embryo development. So, for instance, in, in London, there's a group there, Kathy Nyakan, who is, is working on that um, technology as a way to study development. But also there was the case in, in China of a group here, Professor Hay, who um, decided completely illegally and, and without any kind of proper... Uh, ethical approval, decided to um, create twins that are resistant to HIV. Now, the reason that he gave for that, uh, what he did, was that these twins would be uh, allowed the father who had HIV to then have these, these twins. Well, actually, that's kind of a red herring, really, because it's possible to um, have a child if you've got HIV as a man, and you can, you can wash the sperm, you can clean the sperm. And actually, he, he was really quite deceptive, the way that he persuaded the parents to get involved in this project. But what we now have um, are two twins that have been born with a gene defect that makes people resistant to HIV. Uh, unfortunately, we now know that this gene defect also has other implications. It seems to lead to a slightly shortening of lifespan. So a highly unethical situation there. And, and, and in the minute, uh, Professor Hay is now in jail for three years because uh, he's been uh, punished for his actions. So some people might say that's a fairly light sentence for what he's done. But anyway, he has obviously shown that one can modify the human embryo, not just that we can create people that have been born uh, after this gene editing. Now, some people have proposed that, you know, does that mean in the future we'll have attempts to create the next Einstein or, you know, the next Ronaldo or, or Messi or footballers or, or, or Mozart or, or some Picasso or something? And I, what I tend to say when, when I debate these issues is, of course, the more we learn about the genome and its role in not just disease, but in human characteristics like intelligence and sporting ability and musical ability, um, the more we're starting to recognize that it's a very complex thing. It's about nature and nurture. And even the idea that you would try and create um, an individual in this way could completely backfire. For instance, there's, there's a lot of overlap between individuals who are very intelligent and, and people who have schizophrenia. So, of course, you have to be careful that in trying to make a highly intelligent person, you don't end up with someone with a mental disorder. Um, Lionel Messi is a good example of someone who was actually born with a so-called defect and that he was born with a, um, a growth hormone defect. And um, that meant that when he was a small boy growing up in Argentina, he became very good at dribbling around the other players because he had this defect because he was so small. And when his, his talent was recognised, then Barcelona Football Club then paid for him to have growth hormone treatment. That means that he's now um, five foot seven inches, I think, which is about the same size as me, which is quite small, but clearly not uh, too too small to be a world class footballer. Some would say one of the greatest footballers we've had for some years. Um, but clearly, you know, creating a child that had a growth hormone defect, forcing them to then battle against the other boys uh, to become a world class footballer isn't what we really consider to be a good strategy in terms of children. And of course, this is only the, the potential problems. There are many other people out there who would say, well, people shouldn't be allowed to even, scientists shouldn't be even allowed to create these differences. So lots of controversial points there. And in fact, the thing I wanted to really end on then is to say like all major technologies, I, I think we have to 
see really that gene editing is an incredibly valuable and potentially valuable technology, um, but also a one that could be misused. And so I've, I've highlighted here some of the uh, potential issues. Uh, property rights uh, obviously is a big issue. Who owns this technology? There's a, currently a big patent battle going on between the University of Berkeley and MIT in the States about who originally designed this technology. We've got all sorts of issues about the rights of the individual versus society. Should it be okay for parents to decide to have their, their children of the future created to be uh, potentially better than, than other people? Or, or should we say, well, no, this should be not allowed by any, you know, it should be a social decision. Um, the, the safety and security, although I've highlighted the more positive ways this technology can be used as, some, as well as some of the more controversial ways. There have been uh, fears there about uh, safety and security. Could it be used to create a new bioweapon? And one thing I think it's worth saying at this point is that although you know, some people speculate about the possibility of using this kind of technology for bioweapons, actually you don't have to look far around the world to realize that nature itself is really quite capable of coming out with some quite nasty viruses and bacteria. I think the COVID uh, virus itself is that the SARS-CoV-2 virus itself is a good example of a virus that really uh, I don't believe these this speculation that was invented in the lab I think it just really came from bad practice and uh, you know some of these these markets in China that um, that, that really the health and safety wasn't good there's, there's an, even an argument that by destroying ecosystems this may have allowed the spread of this virus from bats to people but either way, it's definitely a, a virus that came out of, of, of nature rather than being created in some kind of lab. Um, but of course, we don't want to be uh, blasé about the possibilities of this kind of technology being misused in that way. And that's why obviously we need proper safety and security issues in our universities and, and to make sure this is not misused in that kind of fashion. And then finally, the, um, the value to humanity. Well, I think this is, is a very important general point that any technology uh, developed by scientists has the potential to be misused. We've seen this with atomic energy. Um, for instance, we've seen this with, 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 with uh, pesticides and insecticides. It can, can cause all sorts of problems. And so I think that's why it's very important that we have the debate about the use of the technology and who's using it and who's regulated to use it. Um, but ultimately, I would say it's been a revolution in our ability to manipulate the genome. Uh, and in that sense, uh, for me, it's been one of the major steps forward uh, in, in terms of human uh, human uh, history. But having said that, what we really need is, is responsible use of this technology, democratic decisions made about the use of the technology. Uh, and that's why we're, hopefully we're having this kind of debate about uh, the, the technology itself. So I'll leave that there. Uh, as I said, I'm quite happy to answer questions um, about uh, what I've just talked about. Hope that all made sense. Hello. <coughs> Hello. Hello there. Uh, no problem uh, from us. It's uh, from you. You can share again. Okay. You, you, want me, well, you want me to share the talk again? Okay. Uh, uh, I can do it. Sorry to sort of uh, <clears throat> Professor Parrington has finished his presentation. Yeah, I've uh, finished okay. the presentation now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, dear participant, if there is any inquiry or any uh, asking, I think it's best to uh, the last of uh, the workshop. Now, uh, Dr. Ala Shalan. Uh, okay. <clears throat> uh, if you are ready, you can start. All right. Uh, before, before, you, uh, before uh, your start, I think there is somebody raise hand for uh, inquiries. Are you ready, Dr. John, for uh, yes, of answering? Happy to, happy to okay. answer any questions. Okay, uh, Dr. Milad. Yes. Hello, everyone. Victoria. Okay. Do you uh, hear me? You can ask. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah, okay. Thank you very much, Thank you very much Doctor. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here with us, uh, Dr. Parrington, and for, its, uh, for this uh, precious lecture. Thank you very much. 
Uh, I have uh, two uh, questions. Uh, I am Dr. Milad uh, Al Nasri from Iraq Ministry of Health. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is about the new kit uh, for diagnosis for diagnosis uh, COVID-19, which uh, combines uh, uh, the uh, this uh, scissor system, or as we can say, uh, CRISPR uh, Cas9 for uh, diagnosis the uh, COVID-19. Of of course, you heard about it. Uh, we need to know uh, more about this uh, kit, uh, uh, the diagnosis uh, principle, and so on. The second thing, the, se uh, the second thing is about the um, genetic engineering, and uh, it's uh, uh, about the uh, problematic issues, about this uh, moral issues. Um, one of them is uh, CRISPR uh, Cas9. To maybe uh, in your lecture, you said that maybe a, a superhuman, we can say, uh, it can uh, create. There is a barrier. There's a moral bi barrier between human and a superhuman. Uh, and you mentioned it uh, in, in your lecture. Uh, I think uh, variations, some genetic variations between population uh, needed, needed, if you uh, uh, agree with me, uh, Dr. Parrington. Some variations, yeah. some, some the genetic variations are good for, for fitness, for our fitness. And that's all I wanted to say. And thank you very much again. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Those are very interesting questions. Yeah, I mean, in terms of COVID, I may have misunderstood it, but as I see it, the main problems at the moment are to, um, on the one hand, to find a test that will allow us to tell if someone has been infected it ha has the infection, so of course we can use PC, standard PCR methods to do that. Um, and but obviously, what we need is a specific test that is not going to give false positives or negatives. And then the other thing we need is a good test for seeing if someone has got immunity to that virus, or at least he's got antibodies to that virus. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, as, as I see, the, these are fairly standard technologies. You know, of course, what we would also like to do is to use CRISPR-Cas to create uh, models for studying this disorder. So in particular, we've been studying the TPC proteins, and they are proteins that the virus uses to get inside the cells. So we've had an interest there in using these to see if we can develop um, a way to see if we can block the, the, the virus getting into the cell using the knockout technology. And then obviously you'd be able to say, well, maybe that could be then developed as a drug. It does concern me that there's so much focus on vaccines, which quite rightly, obviously, because the vaccine is, uh, is, is a key way of t combating a virus. But I do think we need to be looking more at drugs that could specifically target um, COVID-19. Uh, uh, sorry, concern... but I, 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 well, I asked about the, uh, the newly uh, discovered kit uh, diagnostic kit uh, uh, using a uh, CRISPR Cas9 uh, uh, technique to, uh, okay. to, uh, to diagnose the COVID 19 uh, based on uh, the uh, ability of this uh, technology to, uh, to, to be uh, between two brackets assessors to, uh, uh, to have endonuclease uh, ability to uh, cut the uh, to cut and uh, diagnose the uh, genetic, some genetic sequence in the uh, virus, COVID-19. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think one of the values of, I'm, I'm not sure of the specifics of that use, but one of mm. obviously the important points about CRISPR. Sorry, is John, for interrupting. I might, I might be able to answer the question. Okay, so, fine. Why do you... <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so uh, after you finish, so probably I'll, I'll, I'll explain more about Sherlock. Sherlock is, is a kind of a, a new diagnostic tool being developed mm -hmm. by uh, Zhang uh, Group yes. in MIT, and they use the, uh, uh, the CAS13 uh, as a tool to cleave the RNA, the viral RNA. RNA and that would, yes, mm -hmm. and that would give uh, um, a, a kind of a, a colorimetric uh, um, identification for the uh, for the virus, uh, well, the COVID-19, if, if any presence in the in any solution or any, or any surfaces. Yes. So, uh, and, and well, the entire procedure is called the Sherlock, a deep learning approach to uh, semantic data type uh, detection. And, yes, uh, I've read about it recently. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think one, one, of the, one of the problems that my uh, uh, 
drives with these systems like they require the uh, recombinant protein of the Cas13, which is uh, right now there is no commercial source for this protein available, and it's only available at uh, Zan Group uh, in, in in MIT. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is no way you can use the the RNA. Some uh, restriction, some yes. restriction, or yeah, so it's still uh, yeah, so probably is going to take it still under of, experimental. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Sorry for interrupting, Professor Barrington. <laughs> and that's fine. That's, that's a brilliant explanation of it. I mean, I think in general, I could have stressed even more that the CRISPR-Cas technology is not only useful for creating knockouts or knock-ins, but can be used in all sorts of valuable ways to study, um, you know, positions of genes in the genome, or it can turn genes on or off. It's, it's an incredibly versatile tool. And obviously, that's just one example that you've raised of the way it can be used. Um, the, la the second question you had about the importance of genetic variability in people. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think these kind of grand dreams about kind of creating superhumans and, and so on and so forth. I think it's very important we value the diversity in the human population. Uh, and we don't think that, you know, so now we should be trying to use genetic engineering to create, you know, better people. Because clearly people have all sorts of... Um, flaws and 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 and, and uh and, and positive qualities and it's very difficult to say how that relates to, to genetics you know the more we learn about genetics the more we realize that someone's what a flaw can be also a positive thing in, in different circumstances we're recognizing that people with autistic spectrum disorder we call it a disorder but they clearly have all sorts of ways they can hello hello contribute to hello. hello hello yeah so so i think you're quite right we shouldn't be trying to uh, modify life in that way. Yeah, absolutely. Allah يسلمك الجميع إن شاء الله. هسا إحنا بالمحاضرة تما داخل. جمار. All right. Uh, sorry, I think Dr. Uh, Jabbar uh, is on 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 a phone call and he doesn't know. Uh, like. That's fine. Yeah, his, yeah, his yeah, microphone yeah. is working. Yeah. I'll yeah. I'll I'll mute now, so I'll uh, yeah. stop. Yeah. Apologies, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Sar Hassanian, Afu Mojud. I'm Victor Nasimak Mojudin. El Afu Yani Abdullah. Hello. Uh, uh, Okay. Uh, hello, Dr. Ala. Uh, please, Dr. Uh, Dr. Haytham, Dr. Baji Majda, I will, uh, you can inquire at the end of the workshop. Now, uh, Dr. Ala Hajim, yeah. are you ready? Yes, I am. I'm okay, okay, you. start. Uh, you can start. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present this work in, in this meeting. And, uh, I'm extremely thankful for uh, John Pankton for the time and effort he spent on this preparation for accepting our invitation as well. Uh, actually, I'll start with the, so my presentation is actually as a practical guide how to create a, a knockout model, uh, especially uh, in, in, in mammal and, and building a mammalian model for uh, um, like diseases and, and, for, and like for uh, bio uh, physiological purposes. So I'll start with the, with the gene knockout. My name is Ala Hachim and, uh, um, and, and I work in the um, uh, Department of Anatomy, uh, College of Veterinary Medicine in uh, Al-Qadis University. And uh, this part of work is, is, is actually part of my uh, default study uh, back in Oxford with John Parrington. Um, uh, I'll try to give an introduction about uh, um, how to create uh, this model. I'll start with uh, defining a KO model or a knockout model. What is a knockout model? A knockout model is, uh, is a non-human species that lacks certain gene or genes mostly are made for the purpose of investigating phenotypic alteration of the gene loss. And that uh, has a wide applications, and especially in case of the understanding the mechanism of actions of specific protein or proteins. 
and the pathophysiology of the cellular pathways and in drug discovery, um, it provides a uh, unprecedented way to uh, uh, identify the new drug targets in the genome also uh, can be used for behavioral and neurological uh, uh, studies. So what I'm, uh, what I'm doing here with, the, with this presentation, so I'm, I'm presenting this, this work uh, and you can implement your way of uh, doing a knockout by following the sequence I've made here. So um, uh, I've chosen a mouse as a model for fertilization in mammals. I chose fertilization because I'm very interested in in embryology and in fertilization in mammals. So uh, with, with John, I worked together on targeting uh, a, a protein called PLC zeta. It's, in, uh, it's only expressed in sperm cells of, of every mammals on the planet. So we targeted the coding sequence for a mutation to generate a mouse model that is lacking PLC zeta. So uh, before that, I needed to build up an extensive background information to understand the situation and why do I need to build this model. Uh, uh, another uh, point uh, it was the rationale for this study, why I'm developing this model system. Uh, actually, there was a lack of model at that time in 2013, <clears throat> and that was uh, uh, all the signs that linked with fertilization, especially the egg activation. I mean, the egg activation, it means that when the embryo transform from a zygote, a single cell into a two cell stage embryo, that is activation that when you activate an, an, an embryo. Uh, at that time, the, all the findings were, were partially stagnant because of the absence of such a model. And then I would join and part of my default study, I decided to go through this route and create a model for fertilization. And then later we needed to um, uh, de decide which animal is the best and we found the mouse, it was the best model as mouse can represent a human in, especially in embryonic and genetic disease, uh, uh, diseases and, uh, and other forms as well. Uh, uh, at that time we didn't have a, a we haven't decided about what KO approach, what, is not, what, what kind of a, a knockout approach we should follow. There were um, um, previous uh, genetic modification approaches like zinc finger Indian nucleases and talon. But in 2013, when I started my default, the, in the year before, it's into, in the late 2012, uh, Jennifer Doudna and uh, Zahan Group from MIT they published uh, uh, the first papers on utilizing CRISPR-Cas9 in uh, creating a transgenic animal. I'll come to this part later. Uh, and then after you choose or you decide to go through the KO approach, you have decided to which approach you should follow, and then you need uh, to discuss what kind of uh, pathways you must follow to, uh, for the production of production and identification of homozygous mutants. What I mean by, t by humos, homozygous mutant, it means they, both alleles of the gene have received a mutation and all the uh, alleles uh, represent a deletion site with a knockout effect. And then after I confirm the uh, knockouts have been made by the uh, uh, by the model on the modern side, the model by the uh, CRISPR-Cas9 or the KO approach in this sense, <clears throat> then I can study the homozygous mutant, the pure homozygous mutant, uh, and study the phenotypic alteration, especially in the sense of what the effect of this alteration on fertilization in mammals, and see what kind of uh, defect I have created and what kind of uh, cellular pathways will reveal itself after uh, uh, the absence or the uh, providing the null background for uh, this study. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll take you to the, firstly, I'll take you to the extensive background information about the gene of, uh, of interest in here in this case is the PLC zeta. Uh, I'll start with mammalian egg activation. And, and keep in mind, you can, you can uh, imply your model system on, on this uh, uh, sequence of events and you can choose whatever gene you like. But in this uh, presentation, I only used my uh, uh, the, uh, protein or protein of interest uh, that I'm interested in because I had experience with working with it, <clears throat> excuse me. 
So I will start with mammalian egg activation. Egg activation is actually is a transforming as a fertilized zygote into a two cell stage embryo, and then the two cell stage embryo take up into the mature individual. When the sperm enters uh, enter the oocyte, they trigger uh, uh, um, an event called an egg activation. These events are always been accompanied by calcium release in a cyclic manner. And this calcium is always being uh, triggered from uh, an endoplasmic reticulum, the storage site for the calcium inside the oocyte. So every time there is a sperm inside the oocyte, the oocyte starts to beat with the uh, increased and decreased uh, concentration of calcium. And that can be monitored with the calcium dye and, uh, and uh, a fluorescent microscope. It's a very easy process. You just need to have the, uh, the setup uh, required to, for this uh, uh, identification process. And that has been monitored. I mean, the calcium oscillation has been a vital step in, in this transitional process to uh, embryogenesis. And if you, so if you block either the, the, the calcium or the IP3, is, IP3 is the driver for the calcium oscillation in this sense. So the, the sperm releases an enzymatic compound and that compound binds, it creates an IP3 and the IP3 triggers the calcium oscillation in eggs. So if you block the calcium at the early stages of fertilization, uh, or you block the IP3 uh, uh, receptor on the endoplasmic reticulum, you would block fertilization at all. And that has been uh, seen in, uh, in, in, in finding that uh, calcium is essential in, in, uh, in the OOSI to embryo transition in the processes that include a blocking polyspermy. Polyspermy that when it blocks by, by the cortical granules excitosis, it's a lytic enzyme that get released outside to prevent multiple sperms from entering the oocyte. Also, uh, the, the calcium has been found, this calcium oscillation in mammals found being responsible for resumption of the second meiotic division. It's, it's only happened that the second meiotic division only occurs only if there is a calcium oscillation. And the, the, the last one is the metoplic activation of the egg and the formation of the male and female pronucleus. It means that the, the, the calcium will provide the, a, the ATP in, uh, for the developing embryo. And without that calcium, there will be no embryogenesis at all. Uh, at that time, uh, the, the source of fertilization was mainly the IP3 uh, triggering the, the receptor on the endoplasmic reticulum. And the source of this IP3 um, uh, before 2002 were uh, the, the uh, family of phospholipase C enzymes. The phospholipase C enzyme is, an, uh, is a membrane-associated enzyme, a membrane-associated enzyme that has a cleaving ability to the PIP2. PIP2, in this sense, is the substrate. It's called um, phosphatidyl inositol uh, trisphosphate. And when uh, the PLC one of the PLC members get activated by any uh, ligand or any activation factor that would cleave the PIP2, PIP2, that would cleave the PIP2 to produce an IP3 and a diamino acyl, the IP3 and diamino acyl. When IP3 meets um, the, the receptor on the endoplasmic reticulum, that would trigger the calcium oscillation. Uh, at that time, there were uh, around four isoforms of this protein, and none of these proteins, when you inject inside the oocyte, can produce the same calcium oscillation that being generated by the sperm itself. So uh, the, the general belief that there was uh, another factor, undiscovered factor, that can trigger the fertilization in mammals and in humans. And indeed, in 2000, uh, sorry, um, <clears throat> I skipped uh, someone, uh, some number of slides here. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, and indeed, in 2002, uh, uh, Sanders and others, including John Parrington, discovered that uh, a protein called PLC zeta is a testis, testis specific protein uh, found only in the testes of mammals and some vertebrates. Uh, and this is the form of the protein contain four domains, the C2 domain, oh, okay, I'll start from the EF, the hand domain, the X and Y, and the C2 domain. And was the shortest form of the PLC. 
Uh, and uh, uh, so in 2002, they published this paper when they, they discovered that this protein expressed in sperm cells when they get, when the uh, recombinant form of this protein get injected or the uh, full length of the RNA injected inside the oocyte, it mimics the, the sperm entry uh, by cleaving the PIP2 substrate and produce IP3 and that generated the calcium release. And that was the first confirmation that, that PLC zeta was, was actually the, the egg activating factor and also has been witnessed in, in inducing cell cycle resumption and blocking of polyspermy. Further evidence came from immune staining studies that localized this, the, the protein to the head of the sperm, both in animals and in human. Following years, have confirmed the, uh, the candidate uh, at the PLC Zeta as, as one of the best candidates for egg activation. However, in 2007, a number of papers came to disapprove the, the previous finding and, set, uh, casted, uh, and casted significant doubt on the rule of PLC Zeta. Uh, but not until uh, uh, what my story comes where I, I put the, the final dots on these uh, uh, lines. But before that, in 2009, uh, human infertility, uh, human, uh, cases of human infertility have been uh, uh, observed or diagnosed uh, with a mutated form of PLC zeta, started from 2009 and 2012. Uh, they discovered that, so if I, if I speak, uh, if I try to explain the, 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 uh, the protein domain of the PLC zeta, it, it contains the X and Y domain, uh, and actually it holds the active site for the cleaving site for the PIP2. Uh, and that would, this site is actually the site that generates the IP3 production and the calcium oscillation. So they discovered a mutation on the X and, and Y domain. And uh, they discovered this in a human, uh, and uh, uh, all those patients uh, can be recognized with this uh, with, with somewhat like a very good quality of sperms. However, they were uh, unable to have babies, unable to generate uh, fertilization. So, um, if you take uh, um, full length of their RNA or their component protein of their mutated form uh, PLC zeta from their sperm cells, you inject them inside the oocyte, you won't, you wouldn't get, you wouldn't get any calcium oscillation at all. And that was the first confirmation from the clinical field that egg activation failure can occur. Previously, that was uh, um, uh, recognized as unexplained infertility where the male and female, they do have, the male, have, uh, the male has a, a very good sperm quality and the female has a, a very good quality of oocyte. However, they fail to have babies, uh, especially when they inject the sperm directly into the oocyte. Uh, and that, uh, that's, that kind of practice is usually uh, occur or uh, uh, seen in, in IVF clinics. Uh, however, with these cases, they usually fail to induce uh, uh, embryogenesis. And they, um, uh, for, and I would, the kind of a treatment for these cases, they usually provide the oocyte with, this, uh, with the chemical stimulants as external stimuli to stimulate uh, fertilization. However, the calcium uh, signature of these chemical uh, 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 stimulants are uh, massively different from the physiological uh, signal that are produced by PLC zeta. Uh, and so pre-2013, several attempts have been made to create a mouse model lacking sperm PLC zeta. However, none were successful. And that was an urgent manner, matter for the, uh, for the biomedical, uh, I mean, for the fertilization field, because only uh, a mutant mouse that would provide the, the full detail of the story of the fertilization. And here comes the, the CRISPR-Cas system, a gene editing tool being developed by, and, uh, by the Jennifer Doudna and Zhang group. Uh, uh, both uh, reported in 2012 uh, the uh, harnessing ability uh, of the CRISPR-Cas9 to modify uh, eukaryotic genomic DNA. I, it means by cutting uh, mammalian uh, and uh, well non-bacterial DNA into uh, by creating double strand breaks. So how does this system work? Uh, firstly, I will talk about the system. Actually, works by 
by providing a protein called Cas9. This Cas9 is a bacterial protein, naturally uh, occurring or naturally developed protein inside most of the bacteria, especially uh, firstly discovered in the uh, streptococcus, uh, streptococcus pyrogenes. And that protein um, works by cleaving uh, double strand, uh, the double-strand DNA by creating double breaks on the double strands. However, the system requires uh, another component to be efficiently working, which is, in this case, is the, the guided RNA, or what's called the single guided RNA. So you need a guide RNA that match the, the, the DNA uh, sequence, and then the Cas uh, protein will cut at the matching site, a specific location called the PAM sequence. A PAM sequence, it's an NGG sequence uh, that recognizes the cutting site. That is naturally occurring, and that is the way how the bacteria fight, uh, uh, phag uh, phagocyte, uh, of how to fight uh, uh, bacteriophage in infections. And it's kind of, it's called a type of um, adaptive immunity of the bacteria against phages invading. So uh, the system offers a, a huge potentials as the system, uh, utilizing the system in mammals to create a double knockout, offers the uh, huge simplicity and efficiency. What you need to do is like you can only provide the Cas9 and the GAD RNA for your specific, for a specific location on the, on the genomic DNA and that would directly cut the DNA into two pieces. That would save time and the targeting efficiency in such application is very, very huge. So um, compared to uh, one to 2%, uh, uh, maybe less in zinc, finger, zinc, zinc fingers and talon endonucleases, targeting efficiency in, in adherent cells uh, with the, uh, by utilizing this uh, approach is, uh, is around like a 15 to 20%. However, in, in, uh, in, while well, if you inject uh, this component uh, or the mix inside the uh, mammalian zygote that would end up with 70% mutagenesis. Also, you can do multiplexing mutation. It means you can, uh, you can uh, mutate a single gene and you can uh, mutate a thousand genes in the same time. Uh, the technology has no limit in this sense. Also, you can do in vivo and vitro platform uh, um, uh, mutation. You can do it in uh, in tissues, uh, in live tissue inside the brain of, of a mouse, for example, or you can do it in, uh, inside uh, uh, on uh, adherent cells in a, in a tissue culture, uh, culture dish. However, the system uh, also showed some limitations. These limitations uh, are recognized as the main one as the potential of target mutation. It means so if the targeting efficiency of this gene requires 20 nucleotide, 20 nucleotide, you need to design in order to cut the DNA the, at the specific location you, you desire. So if, if, you, uh, if there is another sequence in the genomic that has a, a 19, that has a 19 nucleotide similarity uh, to the cutting side, that may cut. Um, uh, at an off-target mutation, if, uh, when you create an undesirable mutation by landing somewhere in the genome, and that would create an undesirable effect for the uh, genetic modification. The other one is one of the limitations is the, the somatic and allele complicity and mosaicism. Uh, this system has the, uh, the power to cut continuously until the end uh, or uh, the, the expired, the, I mean the, the end of the RNA, the Cas9 RNA or the Cas9 protein activity. So it means like <clears throat> if, if you inject it inside the oocyte, if they inject the protein inside the oocyte along, along with the, uh, uh, the, the guided RNA, it will continuously cleave even after the two cell stage embryo or four cell stage embryo. And that would create a complex uh, in the allele, in the somatic allele distribution in the system, and that would you end up with a mosaic animals like uh, hold uh, lots of uh, uh, dis uh, disentangled uh, alleles uh, inside the uh, individual. But that can be overcome by a, a new tool called, uh, well, a modified tool. Let's say it's a it's a mutated version of the Cas9. It's called the Cas9 case 
uh, also invented by um, uh, Zhang Group at the MIT. So what they did is that they use a double nickel system, a system that can only nick, not create a double strand cleave, that only nick at, at the opposite side of the, of the double strand with, the, with the providing two guide RNAs for each Cas9, and that would create an efficiency. If these cuts very close to each other, that will be treated as the Cas9 wall type double strand break, and that would create the deletion site for the gene by uh, non-homologous end joining. Uh, however, if the cutting site is far away, the, uh, the, uh, the, the mutation will fail and the, the system will stay integral without any effect on uh, this targeting site. And so and that was one of the mechanisms, one of the approaches I use in creating the transgenic animal light um, with the PLC zeta. So what we did, we follow the, the, the both, uh, both approaches. So the first one is to use, utilizes the, the, the Cas9 case, the double case system, and we use the, the wild type Cas9 in two different setups to create two different uh, mouse colonies. Um, uh, the, the idea was to uh, create a, a, a backup system kind of uh, to see if uh, any undesirable effect of the wild type on generating an off target that can be rescued by, by the, the, um, uh, the double Nikkei system. So we, we targeted exon three of the PLC uh, gene by the double Nikkei system while we targeted the exon five uh, by, with the wild type. Uh, keep in mind that all the targeting places have been designed to be to the enzymatic activity of the protein. So uh, what I mean, like most of the enzymatic of the uh, activity of the protein localized in this transcriptional area here in the exon 6. However, all the, these have been designed to pre-cut the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the active site of the protein. And that, the idea was to damage uh, the, uh, the cutting sign and to pre prevent formation of any fragments of this, this protein that might be able to give a false positive read uh, after generating the mouse colony. Uh, <clears throat> so um, in, in, in basic steps, we, cr we created this uh, uh, Cas9 <clears throat> and, uh, and uh, guide RNA mix, and then we injected the, the mix inside a zygote and then we kept the zygote for 24 hours in the lab and then we gave it a well, well, we did embryo transfer and then we collected the progeny. But before that, we needed to generate an sgRNA. The sgRNA is the guide, is the template uh, that uh, works on creating cleavage on, on, the, on the desired location of PLCZ. So, um, uh, so what we needed to, we needed to choose a 20 nucleotide, in the coding sequence of exon two and exon five, plus the NGG. The NGG is the PAM sequence. It's where the, 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 the Cas9 localized the region as a potential place for cutting the double strand break and to create the double strand break. So we chose a 20 nucleotide plus the NGG. Uh, the NGG is really, like you can find it everywhere in the genome. So it becomes very easy to to the Cas9 or the, uh, the, either the, the wild type or the case to identify any NGG location at the genome and they can cut it easily with the providing the, the guided RNA. Uh, and then we, I, I followed, uh, followed the, the CRISPR design tool. Uh, currently there are a countless number of uh, web-based uh, uh, tools for designing uh, the guide RNAs. So the only you need to do is like you, you pick a 20 nucleotide plus the NGG from any sequence you like, from any protein you like, your interest. And then you plot it inside the, the, this uh, look, uh, website or other website. Uh, this one belongs to Zang Group. And that will give you the, the, uh, the, the, the sequence. That would give you the sequence that required to create uh, the sgRNA as a component for the guide RNA, uh, for, uh, for the Cas9 to work on. And then we synthesize these RNA. You need to synthesize these RNA to make them uh, more uh, like uh, geometrically uh, fixed to the Cas9. 
and that you can uh, I followed Passage and Liu uh, 2014 at that time but the, right now there are a, a really big number of papers that can describe how to uh, uh, synthesize the sgRNAs very easily and it's it's a two days across a procedure in, in the lab it's can, anyone can do it uh, those who especially who has like a basic information in molecular biology so we designed the RNA we just we designed the, we, we got the sequence and then we designed the sgRNA and then we cloned these um, sgRNA into uh, a, a cas9 uh, vector or the Nikase vector and you can purchase purchase this vectors from uh, commercial sources available. The idea is like we created a vector, uh, a plasmid that can be used to test the efficiency of the cutting. Because uh, before, before going into injecting these components inside uh, a, a mouse embryo and then wait several months for these, uh, for, for these animals to, pre like to, to deliver and to become adult, and then we decide if these animals are mutants or not. You need to study, we needed to study the cutting efficiency of these guide RNAs in our systems, especially in, in, in embryonic stem cells. And then after this point, we uh, will later decide if these guide RNAs are good enough to generate a mutation or not. And when this, uh, <clears throat> this approach, we uh, utilize these vectors as a, a way to transfect the embryonic stem cells. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and after after transfection, you you still need to do the selection. And this selection is based on uh, uh, you have two options. You either go with a pure mycelia resistant gene uh, uh, selection or a GFP. So with a GFP, you can monitor, you can visualize directly that you can see uh, the mutated uh, colonies inside the cells have been lit up with the green light, while in puromycin, if you add the toxic dose of puromycin to cells, some will survive. Those who survive the puromycin killing curve, those who hold, who contain the mutation. And then you can select this and you can choose uh, the cells. Uh, the cutting efficiency were analyzed the later with the genotyping, we take these selected uh, colonies of cells, and then we did genotyping, sequencing, melt analysis, and tide analysis to dis disentangle the allele complexity after the uh, uh, cutting uh, of the um, uh, CRISPR-Cas system. Uh, and then, so later we, we decided to, we are going to with the Cas double NIK system, you need uh, two, um, uh, uh, two primer sets for, for this uh, to work, and what with the wild tab is only one single primer set to work with. Then later, what we did, we, we, we did, it's like we, we made the, uh, the sgRNA, and we took the, uh, the RNA for the, uh, the, the Cas9, either the Nikes or the wild tab, we mix them together when we inject them inside the oocyte of a fertilized oocyte, it's after a fertilization. So we, what we do is like natural, we, we do like a super ovulation before the uh, naturally inseminated female, like 13 hours or 16 hours later, we collect the zygotes and we do the injections with the aid of a micro injection. And we, uh, we created two uh, setup with the first one with the, with the Nikkei, the other one with the, with the, with the wild type Cas9. Uh, and then we, uh, um, put the or, or, or embryo transfer the uh, the embryos to to a recipient female. Mainly, like you inject between five and ten picoliters of CRISPR Cas9 uh, into a, a, a mixture. Uh, so you have two options here. You either you either provide the Cas9 as a protein or you provide it as an RNA. If you provide the Cas9 as a protein, you have a, a, a very better cutting efficiency and very fast actions of cutting uh, compared to the RNA because the RNA usually takes two hours inside the oocyte to work to produce the protein of the Cas9 and then to bind with the guide RNA and then to cut the specific location on the, uh, on the genome. However, with the protein, it's easier, it's, it's better. How, uh, what, what, like one of the one of the limitation of this uh, working with the protein is extremely expensive, and the other point uh, at that time in two thousand and fourteen there was there wasn't any available source uh, 
to, uh, to purchase this protein. And the only uh, source we had for this protein is to utilize the RNA for this protein. However, if you use the protein, if you use the RNA, uh, you would increase the uh, level of uh, multiplex, uh, allele multiplex uh, uh, variety or uh, the amount of alleles you generate with the RNA, it's, it's higher than the Cas9. The Cas9 usually, you, it, it find the protein, it finds the, uh, the cutting site and it cuts it and that's it. And uh, the protein activity will last on, probably for six hours. But with the RNA, it may last for uh, more than 24 hours. For this reason, it may cut in the first uh, uh, plastomere of the, OS, uh, of the, of the resulting uh, uh, embryo. And then later, 24 hours, in four cell stage, it will continue to cut continuously uh, without any uh, stopping. And that would create a multiplexing of the allele complexity. And then you would end up with animals holding uh, the severe mosaicism and very difficult to disentangle which allele you should transfer for the pure homozygous one. <clears throat> and then, so we, we, when we got the, um, uh, the animals after uh, uh, they get delivered, the F0, we call it the, the, the progeny zero offspring, we, uh, we did the biopsies. <clears throat> biopsies, we took uh, like a tail tips or ear clips from the animals and we did genomic analysis PCR sequencing, HRM, uh, high, uh, high resolution multi-analysis. Uh, and also I did, what I did is like I did um, a PCR, I, I cloned the PCR product of these animals, the F0 animals into a uh, subclone in, into PGMT vector. Uh, uh, the, the idea is like, since we have multiplexing of allele complexity and there is no way to tell which allele is which, uh, or uh, uh, which is to be transferred and which animals to be prevented from, produce, from uh, crossing with other animals. So we did this uh, uh, subcloning. Subcloning it tells you the exact uh, what's happening. So you, you disentangle the, the genomic DNA into uh, uh, bacterial, uh, into clones of bacteria, uh, and then you would sequence these, these bacteria. Bacterias to get the specific uh, uh, sequence for each uh, allele. So I'll give you an example. This is uh, one of the F0 animals called animal uh, number eight. In animal number eight generated 27 nucleotide deletion and 11, uh, 11, uh, nucleotide, 11 nucleotide insertion on the other side. However, we can see also other alleles also presence with a deletion or uh, with deletion or insertion. Uh, at this level, this this animal is very hard, hard to, to deconvolute because the amount of alleles and the cutting of the DNA material is just so huge that we can't uh, uh, decide if we, uh, we, we decided not to use this animal to be uh, uh, crossed with, other, with the wild type to generate the homozygous mutants. Another point we need to, I, I need to take your attention to is that all, if, if I'm interested in some allele, let's say this and this one, the 27 deletion, that would create a, a frame shift and would create a knockout effect. If I'm interested in transferring this to a pure homozygous animals, I should, we need to be sure that this, this allele is also expressed in the sperm cells and that the animal is able to deliver this, um, uh, this allele into the next progeny. Uh, with, the, with such technology, with, with, with such limitation of the Cas9, we can't we can't decide. So we, we, you get what you get. So then, if you if you if you have only this animal, you cross it with another wild type animal, and you hope that the you hope that the required allele will be passed to the second generation. Otherwise, you use a different animal with better uh, uh, allele um, um, complexity uh, than this one. <clears throat> So um, I think I've mentioned this, but we need to, so in, in the selection criteria of the F0 animals, so the animals, imagine we get like 20 to 30 animals produced from, from CRISPR-Cas9 injection, those animals being delivered, and now they are, uh, uh, let's say, three to four weeks old. Uh, uh, first genomic uh, analysis revealed a huge mutation, different allele complexity, some SNP, uh, some very long uh, deletion sites, some insertion sites, 
and also some SNP localization on the on the genomic DNA of the PLC zeta. And this all on on the on the exon on, on exon three. It means like uh, that is the result of the double nucleus uh, cleavage system. So we need to decide which animal to choose for the uh, transferring the required allele for the to create the pure homozygous uh, or knockout animal. Firstly, we need to decide that the deletion sites that are non-divisible by three nucleotides. It means like any deletion that is non-divisible by three, like a deletion like one deletion in one nucleotide or two nucleotides or maybe 17 or anything that is non-divisible by three, like 22 nucleotides can be used. Because um, uh, as you know, that every three nucleotides generate for a single codon. And if you choose the animals that uh, they do have an, a mutation they, that uh, is a divisible by three, then you would generate uh, a mutated version of the protein, not a full knockout. However, if you do a non-divisible by three, if you select a non-divisible by three nucleotide, that would uh, that would um, uh, rearrange the, the um, DNA sequence and that would scramble the, the, the coding sequence of the protein and the protein eventually will uh, hold a premature stop codon and that premature stop codon later will set this RNA for destruction by the control mechanism of the, of the cell and, that, and, and functionally you would get like a knockout system, full uh, functionally uh, knockout system from uh, non-divisible uh, by three nucleotide deletion. The second point is the size of the deletion. Uh, keep in mind that the large deletion sites are much easier in, in, in identifying homo heterozygous and homozygous mutants from the wild type. The more deletion sites you get, the more deletion, uh, the more size of the deletion you get, the better localization on a gel, and that would give you a really good PCR product that can be ob observed in the, in the gel. Also, you need to um, keep in mind that the sex of the animal. Since this protein uh, is responsible or uh, controlling fertilization, I can't use a male to uh, produce a progeny. So for this reason, we decided to go for the females and mutated F0 uh, females to transfer the alleles to the uh, next progeny and never to use the male because we think that my, the males might, might be, uh, might be uh, mutated and they won't be able to produce any uh, uh, like uh, embryos. The, the, the fourth one is the level of allele complexity and this is a major thing. Animals with more complex traces are less faithful in transmitting the only desired allele. So sometimes you would end up with, uh, with a mixed allele or non-desirable allele that can pass to the second generation and that would create, uh, that would create really frustrating amount of work. Uh, and, and imagine such kind of work is very expensive and time consuming, especially when you deal with an animal colony. Raising an animal colony is a very demanding job. Uh, and very expensive as well. Uh, so you need to be specific and you need to be sure that the desirable allele that you want to transfer to the mutated, to, to the homozygous animal is the one that is going to be uh, transferred through the uh, germina, germ, germ line and uh, the, the allele of interest. So then later after I generated the, the knockout based on the criteria, I crossed the animals with the wild type, the females, the mutant females with the wild type, and they were, then we ended up with having a complete knockout, both in both approaches, the Nikkei's approach and the wild type approach, and that has been confirmed by presence of the deletion side, very clean allele uh, presentation with the tight analysis here, both in the wild type Cas9 and the Nikkei system. And here in the gel, uh, I can see the, 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 the mutated, uh, sorry, it's, this one is the opposite. The mutated one is the, uh, uh, sorry, no, that's correct. The mutated uh, allele is present here where there is a heterozygous uh, animal uh, in both approaches. And this has been confirmed with the <clears throat> antibody against the protein PLC zeta in 
uh, for uh, sperms, immune, uh, immune sperm samples collected from these uh, animals. The next step you need to organize or you need to plan is to what kind of functional analysis you need to do for the mutant animals you are, you are, you are creating. And in my case, I went with uh, how to study sperm. Like since the, the, the protein is expressed in the sperm cells, then I need to intensively uh, study uh, uh, the, uh, the sperm parameters or the spermatogenesis process. If my protein is expressed in brain cells, then I need probably to study brain cells, uh, hematoxylin and eosin and other functional analysis as well. But uh, in my, my case, I did, the, uh, I did study the, uh, uh, the um, functional analysis on the phenotypic analysis on these animals. I started with the spermatogenesis, uh, with the he, uh, HME uh, staining, then I studied the acrosome reaction, sperm penetration assays. It means when the sperm able to penetrate the oocyte. Also, also sperm variability and sperm motility. And um, such kind of uh, uh, functional analysis would provide you with enough information about the system you are creating. So in my system, then I, I provided with these findings, there was no physical difference uh, between the wild type sperm and the uh, mutant sperm, or the homozygous mutant sperm, in terms of the uh, sperm parameters. Uh, and the only difference was that uh, the mutant sperm lacks the expression of PLC zeta. And uh, PLC zeta, uh, again, is non structural protein but it's only a protein that is localized inside the, sper the head of the sperm and it doesn't contribute any to the uh, motility or the variability of the sperm or the ability to induce a cross arm reaction. So, so such kind of a functional analysis you would need to develop in order to uh, understand or in order to examine the, the, um, the animals you created. Then we went, and since the PLC zeta generate calcium signaling inside the oocyte uh, upon injection, so the mutant animals showed zero calcium oscillation uh, in both uh, samples that we sent, one to Belgium, the, the, the other one to the States, and both labs examined the calcium oscillation were zero apart from a single spike here. So what we did, we froze the, the, the sperms of wild type and uh, mutant animals. And then we send, in, we send them to Belgium and to the state and they examined these uh, with immunofluorescent uh, staining. However, the animal mating in Oxford revealed a different story. So what we did when we left the male, the homozygous male with the wild type female, they they, we found that they still generate embryos uh, or they still generate pups However, at a very uh, significantly lower rate, and that would uh, uh, it's like um, that would uh, uh, like that would damage the, the, the entire story, or because the PLCZ, if the PLCZ is the trigger for fertilization, then if we mutate this protein, why we still see for, uh, some pups formation and fertilization that uh, that happen in these colonies? And then later we discovered like, uh, and these animals are the first known animals to be delivered without the, the trigger factor, the PLC zeta. At this time, uh, we didn't know uh, what's going on and, and what's the reason, you know, what is the, the factor that is rescuing the PLC zeta uh, phenotype alteration. Uh, then later that we found that these animals, the, these um, sperms, they are still able to, for, uh, to fertilize, to make fertilization and to bind with the oocyte only when they are fresh, only when the sperm are fresh and gets to interact directly with the, with the membrane of the oocyte. So if I, if, we, if I inject in the sperm directly inside the oocyte, it doesn't work. Only if the sperm can bind to the to the membrane outside the oocyte, and then that the, the compensatory mechanism or the alternative pathway in fertilization can start. However, this alternative pathway without the PLC zeta shows a very low fertilization compared to the wild type, compared to the PLC uh, expressed sperms. And that was the first evidence that PLC is required for the normal physiological fertilization 
uh, and in the absence of the PLC zeta, you would even get a delayed uh, embryogenesis afterwards. Uh, we did a number of uh, calcium analysis then in, in, in Cardiff with the help of Professor Swan. And then we, we found only fresh sperm, only fresh sperm can still produce some uh, viral, viral uh, calcium, uh, calcium spikes during the fertilization. And uh, as I mentioned before, only if the sperm binds to the membrane of the oocyte and not to be inserted inside. And uh, about that way, you would activate the alternative pathway in fertilization. And we were the first to, to, uh, to report such a presence of, uh, of a pathway that can trigger fertilization in the absence of the uh, uh, physiological factor of PLCZ. <clears throat> Later, the, uh, I discovered that at the absence of this factor, PLCZ, I found that <clears throat> the uh, polyspermine, polyspermy, it means when multiple sperms enter the oocyte, I found the, the, the oocyte were riddled with, all number of, with, with a huge number of sperms inside the oocyte. Uh, and the oocyte were extremely uh, um, packed with heads of the sperm inside them. Uh, and that was the first evidence to confirm that PLC zeta is the trigger for cortical granules exocytosis and the blocking of polyspermy by uh, via uh, blocking the uh, zona pellucida, by inducing zona pellucida blockage. And we were the first group um, to, 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 to show that the uh, polyspermy is actually uh, um, one of the factors that can happen at the absence of the uh, PLC zeta. Um, till this moment, we don't know what is the, 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 the alternative pathway in fertilization. What's the factor that rescue the absence of PLC zeta? However, we discovered this when we report this and we found its relevance with the, with the, uh, uh, with the polyspermy uh, formation. Uh, right now, it's we, the only um, um, sure, uh, information we know that it's, it's a membrane protein and it's, um, it has a counterpart on, on the sperm head. Uh, and only when there is a counterpart and it meets the, this uh, membrane factor on the OR side can trigger some sort of calcium oscillation either directly or by cleaving PIV2 to generate uh, the IP3 and the uh, calcium. Uh, the conclusion actually doesn't belong to this presentation. I'm extremely sorry, but one of the main conclusions I, I must say that, uh, well, if you, if you need to design an, uh, a knockout model, you need to be prepared. You need to be vigilant. You need to be always thinking about possible, uh, uh, like difficulties that might face you. Uh, the amount you spend in reading, it will pay you uh, half tea. Like it's one of the best way to do it is like to read, read, read a lot about uh, the protein of interest, and then you decide which uh, pathway you need to to follow. Uh, in, especially if you decided to go with the CRISPR-Cas9 and mutagenesis. Um, uh, also, uh, if you follow the, the mutation, also you need to to, to design your uh, phenotypic analysis or uh, what you're going to do with the animals after you created these animals uh, and what you need to do with it, what kind of an experimentation you need to do and all sorts of uh, experimentation that needs to be done to answer the, the, the question you are asking. And I think uh, this is the end of my uh, presentation and this work has been um, uh, never been able, I, I will never be able to produce such a work without the aid of John Parrington, Jonathan Goodwin, Gida, uh, Andy, uh, Andrew Passe, Trapeti Zora, and uh, Bjorn Hendricks from uh, Belgium and Carl Swan from Cardiff. And um, I think with this, I end the presentation and um, uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop with the sharing. If you have any question, please come forth and I, I might be able to, uh, to answer the question. Um, and if you like to ask in Arabic, that's amazing. That's not a problem at all. I'm more than happy to answer in Arabic as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Ala, for this nice presentation. Uh, Regarding the uh, link for registration, we will share it now. Uh, there's uh, uh, someone 
ask uh, Prof. John in the chat, uh, can we use such technology in a human embryos? I don't know, for, for Dr. John or Dr. Uh, uh, Ala, uh, can we use such technology in a human embryos in IVF to transfer mm -hmm. disease free embryos in, in, in families with genetic diseases? At uh, the moment, as far as I understand it, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, at the moment, as I think in every country in the world, really, it's not possible to do germline gene therapy, as it's called. So that would be actually changing the embryo's genome deliberately with something like CRISPR. Though obviously it was done in China, but that was done illegally. And I think the reasons are that there's still concern about the safety implications, but also about the ethics as well. What obviously you can do is to, um, is to select embryos, IVF embryos that have been shown not to have a particular genetic defect. I mean, that, that's already happening, but that doesn't involve CRISPR. That is just selection of embryos after pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And, Personally, I think it's too, it would be too risky at the moment to be using CRISPR therapeutically with embryos. Of course, one could still use it to treat people who have an, a disorder like cystic fibrosis, like Huntington's, like thalassemia, like sickle cell. But that, that's done with the consent of, of an adult or, or, a, or, a, or a child, I guess, a, parent, a child's parents. Yeah, I absolutely agree with <laughs> Professor Parrington as this <clears throat> matter is like, extremely unethical and, and there is no way we can um, um, perform this on human embryos because the, 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 uh, the uh, system is still in its early, it's in infancy and probably requires another, I don't know, five, ten years till we understand the entire mechanism. Then probably later scientists will decide uh, if uh, to use it or not, yeah. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, there is uh, Dr. Ali Brahim. Brahim. Yeah. You can unmute your mic and and ask. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ala, for this nice and precise presentation. Thank you. And so awesome much. information. Okay, I have a couple questions. Uh, first of all, uh, using calcium ionophore for uh, activation of oocyte in IVF, especially if uh, we use um, testicular sperms. Yeah. You said the, uh, the, the key point is the, uh, the cell membrane. So what's the benefit of adding such a chemicals outside the oocyte? So the, th uh, the thing I am... Um, uh, you would generate a non-physiological way of uh, calcium inside the oocyte, and that would you mimic the uh, the way of uh, how PLCZ is working. However, it's not exactly the same. You would generate a wave of calcium instead of uh, an oscillation. So they they usually in the clinics they they follow such an approach because there is no other way to uh, uh, recombinant to protein of PLCZ. That instead of the uh, calcium ionophores, it would be um, uh, uh, it would be really amazing to see if we can, uh, if, uh, like in the future, to to use the the recombinant protein of this PLCZ instead of following the uh, the more uh, chemical and non physiological way of stimulating the oocytes. Uh, might John have something to do? Uh, might might say about the 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 effect of these. Uh, uh, factors or stimulant factors on the epigenetic epigenome of the of the embryo. Yes, I so, mean I think there's an interesting debate at the moment about the importance of the number and frequency of oscillations, uh, because to some extent there's evidence that you know you don't need to have this number of oscillations. You can still induce egg activation, obviously, with calcium ionophore, though. I think the most efficient use of ionophore is when you have a double stimulus there. But Jean-Pierre Azil, in, um, who's now retired, but he did in a number of important studies in mice and rabbits, he showed that the frequency and number of oscillations does have an impact on you know, the embryo gene expression uh, and also qualities in, in, the, in the offspring. So I don't think it's a big question really to be still addressed. 
And one of the things that we would like to do in the future, we're just starting to do to some extent with Bjorn Heinrich's group in Belgium, um, is a paper submitted on this, is to look at the effects of um, different stimuli, calcium and for um, recombinant PLCs eater, uh, for instance, are on gene expression in the embryo. But ultimately, I think to look at the offspring, I think animal model work is still important to be looking at these because calcium monophore is obviously still quite a new technology and, and we do need to be completely sure about the safety of these technologies for the long term as well, not just thinking about whether babies look normal when they're born. Yeah. And thank you so much. My next question, if I can. Yes. Yeah, I, I, when you said about the PLC zeta uh, mutant sperms, if you, if you inject it directly, there is no fertilization, uh, while if uh, conventional IVF, there is a fertilization. So we, in IVF, we, uh, we use ICSI and uh, we face, al although rarely, but it is a disastrous state, uh, failure of, complete failure of fertilization in very rare cases. So can we uh, discover in such a cases, uh, how can we discover such a cases? We, uh, the conventional IVF is better for them than the ICSI. I, I think we can work together on this as a project, our next project, if you want to, <laughs> to collaborate with us. And we can provide, I think, yeah. I think that would yeah. be amazing. It's really amazing. I, I really I would love it. John knows about this. I really I would love to study this. I, so I, I can provide you with all the detail, details you like. Uh, and probably we would do like a setup for uh, to do like so in those patients instead of doing going directly for the invasiveness of the uh, micro injections we can do uh, IVF instead and then we can study the genomic DNA or the RNA uh, from the, those animals and then we decide if those animals uh, sorry if the, the, those patients uh, those animal patients are a mutant or non mutant and then we can confirm the result later. And probably, probably we, can, we can publish this in a really decent journal, if you like. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Anna. Uh, Adra? Adra Hassoun? Adra Hassoun? Naam. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, alaikum salam. Okay. And the uh, Sorry. Majida? Uh, Hello. 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 Menu Majid Awala. Okay. Majid. Thank you so much for having you with this uh, nice information about interesting technology. But when uh, Dr. John talking about uh, the uh, human organ farm inside the pig, I actually didn't uh, understand how he could overcome the problem of organ rejection when the, the human organ developing inside the pigs because of mismatching between the MHC molecule between human and pig? Yes, the, the, the idea behind it is that because the stem cells come from the human, the, the, you know, the tissue matched to an individual, then they shouldn't be uh, rejected by, by that person because on their surface, the, the antigen should be the same as that person. But there's lots of issues still I think to be solved technologically so I mean that the idea that this technology can work is mainly based on the, what's been done in the mouse and the rat I, I suspect there's all sorts of technological issues still to solve um, if it's ever going to work and, and of course some people would would think it's unethical anyway but <laughs> But yeah, a lot, lots of issues to solve. Uh, but as far as I understand, that that's the basic the, the basic thing is that because the stem cells come from an individual, they shouldn't be rejected by that individual, even though grown in a pig. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Majda. Now, uh, Galaxy A7. What is Galaxy A7? Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, now, uh, uh, Dr. Miran Ramahi. Um, thank you, Dr. Ala, for a nice presentation. Thank, Andrea, you. thank you. So much. I am very proud uh, to see your work 
you have Thank done you it in your university. Thank you. Just I have two questions about how can you measure calcium release into OO site? Which uh, like machine you have used in this? Uh, uh, um, all right. Uh, one, so, uh, and second uh, one. Hey, sorry. Yeah. Um, Go when you do the transfection gene into the embryonic stem cell, how do you confirm that the gene has been transfected correctly to the, uh, into the OO site? Very good question. So the first, the first question you can study calcium uh, by using calcium dyes. So you would uh, immerse the oocyte inside the culture dish with the, with the calcium dye, and then you wash it off. But the calcium dye will stay inside the oocyte. Uh, and then you take the dish inside uh, 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 on, 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 uh, on an uh, epifluorescent microscope, and the epifluorescent micro microscope should be equipped with the, uh, the, the, the specific wavelength for that dye to emit light when every time there is a calcium release. So every time there is a calcium release, it will, the calcium will bind with the calcium dye, and that would generate uh, a visible light can be detected by the, the, the sensor of the camera with the epifluorescent microscope. It means you haven't used the flex station to measure the calcium release? I, I'm In, not familiar with the, is it for the cardio, cardiology work, flexi? Yeah, it's mean flex station. This is like machine used to like um, measure the calcium released. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, we in pharmacology we have we have this same in the in the other groups. They they study the the, the problem with the oocyte. It is really small. So yeah. and it's we don't have enough of it to generate a really good signal. So we need to use a higher magnification. Let's say like a forty or a hundred. Okay. Uh, other systems, like in, in, cardio, in, in, in cardiology, uh, in, ca in cardiac research, they usually use uh, uh, adherent cells on, 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 on a dish, uh, culture dish, and they do have uh, really lots of cells growing inside that dish, and they can generate enough signal, even with a 5x or 10x can be measured. In our case, no, we can't. We need to have a higher magnification, and the only system can provide it is with the uh, epifluorescent microscope. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there was another Thank question. Uh, how to be... the, the second yes. question, please. Yeah. 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 The, 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 how to ensure that the, the transfection has happened? <laughs> you have to, well, the thing with the genome, with the, with the CRISPR Cas9, it will happen in 10 to 20%. Okay, you, you, you need to be sure. If it doesn't happen, then there was a problem in, the, in, the, in manipulating or in working with the, with the, with the, uh, I mean, with the constructs or the materials. But if, uh, to be Sure, you can use puromycin gene as a, a selective uh, a gene for uh, against a killing curve. So, what you create, like you, you insert a puromycin resistant gene inside that uh, construct, inside that sequence of DNA, and then you try to kill these cells, transfected cells, with a huge amount of puromycin. And those who doesn't get who, who don't get killed, they are the, the cells that take that, that took up that uh, construct inside them. Okay, okay. There is another approach. There is another approach, is the GFP protein. If you have a construct that has a GFP, green fluorescent protein, yes. only the cells that shows the green fluorescent, it means those cells that have been, have been trans transfected. Yeah, yeah. You're, right. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Uh, uh, I think Ahmed Ali Alwan Abbas raised hand or not? Ahmed Ali Alwan. Okay, finally, uh, if, there, uh, if uh, uh, Haytham present, Haytham here or not? <coughs> okay, uh, Haytham, okay, Haytham. Yes, thank <laughs> thanks, John and Ala for the nice presentation. No okay, question. Okay, doctor. Okay, Dr. Yes, thank you. Thanks, John and Allah, for an informative and nice presentation. My question is uh, the specific timing for uh, gene editing. Okay. So, uh, my question is uh, there is specific timing for gene insertion or editing during embryonic development. Uh, in, yeah. in, in farm animal. And yeah. I mean, you spoke about uh, after fertilization. 
Yes. So there is another timing for the editing. Yes. So you do it within 13 to 16 hours after insemination or after the allied search or with the, like, the, the induced allied search. So after the allied injection, you would keep the, the male and the female together in the same cage and then let them mate naturally. And then 13 to 16 hours, you can collect the, 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 the zygotes. And at that time, you can, you can do the uh, uh, injection of the, the CRISPR-Cas9, uh, like the mix between the, the, the Cas9 and the, the guide RNA. There is another approach. It's like you do fertilization in vitro or intracytoplasmic injection in vitro, and then you do it on the animals. However, this, this might um, um, damage the, effic the, the cutting efficiency of the protein as those embryos has been uh, like uh, exposed to too much, so much uh, environmental factors and that may damage the, 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 the cutting efficiency. It's, it's a personal preference. What do you prefer to? Uh, personally, I prefer to go with the, with the live animal. I mean, like natural mating, uh, no, uh, uh, lack of any extra sperm around the oocyte. Uh, so uh, then I collect these zygotes and then we do the injection directly. It's, it's you who decide, actually. But I usually go with the, with the national medicine, for, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think there is no inquiries. Uh, many, many thanks for uh, Prof. Uh, uh, Barrington for his support and for his participation. Also, uh, many thanks for uh, Dr. Ala Hachim for this nice presentation. Uh, also, uh, thank you very much, uh, my colleagues. Uh, and finally, uh, just uh, I would like to tell you bye bye. Thank you very thank much. You so much. Thank you. It's been thank, a pleasure thank taking you, John. part and talking to you all. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you bye. very much. Bye bye. Thank you.